Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for episode 177 of the MTG Goldfish podcast, and we have something sweet going on this week. This is kind of a special podcast. The crew has been out in Las Vegas for the past week almost, and we're all going home tomorrow, but today we have not only Richard, like usual. How's it going this week, Richard? What's up, Seth? Uh, saying it to your actual face yeah, today? <laughs> saying it to my very tired face. It's been a super awesome but really long weekend here at GP Vegas, but we have a special guest, too, that's not usually here, and that is Tomer. What's going on, Tomer? Hey, everyone. It's Tomer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably better yeah. than that. Probably better than that. just myself. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I haven't been on the podcast since, what, like a year and a half? A year and a bit? It's been a while. I was really shy back then, and uh, now I just don't care anymore. So I'm really excited <laughs> to, to be on the podcast and, and, and spew nonsense for a little bit. Yeah, super excited to have the whole crew together. So we're actually, for the first time ever, just all sitting together in our hotel room around a microphone. So it should be fun. Uh, anyway, our itinerary for this week is pretty simple. We have GP Vegas stuff. Going to talk about some of the highlights, uh, all the craziness of GP Vegas. Then we're going to talk about some spoilers. We got a ton of Corset 2019 spoilers. Today was the official kickoff of spoiler season, and we got like five Mythics or something. So tons of Corset 2019. And then we will wrap it up, like usual, with Fish Mail. But let's jump into it, starting with GP Vegas. So Richard, Tomer, we've been here for about a week so far. What is your overall feeling slash impression of the week at GP Vegas? My feeling is extremely tired, <laughs> Yep. but it was a blast. We were there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. and for the most part, we were just at the convention the entire time watching Seth meet fans. Yeah, yeah, we were there. <laughs> and it was pretty cool because there were so many people coming up to say hi to us. That's Lots that. of people. <laughs> Had Someone said hi to you, Tomer. Yeah. People said hi to you, Tomer. Yeah. People like had too. merch. People had Panormonicons to sign. Mm. Blood moons. Yeah. Boggles. <laughs> yeah, I had to actually deface some boggles. I didn't actually sign them, but I drew mustaches. And so there was also a pithing needle. Pithing needle. One. Yeah, the... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand it at first. Why I was like, why a pithing needle? That's a weird oh, one. Cool, and the person came back to me the next day and was like, pithing needle, your pithing needle. That's that's why I had you sign. I was like, ah, oh, okay, yep, that makes a lot of sense. Awesome. What about you, Tomer? What uh, what stuck out to you or overall impressions of Vegas? I was just surprised at the scope of it. I went to GP Toronto earlier this year, and it was a very big convention hall and it had a lot of people, but there weren't a lot of vendors, and there was. A like maybe one or two artists signing in a, in a spot. I think Wedge was there, but I didn't get to uh, run into him. But it was, you know, what I, what I kind of expected from a GP. And then I came to GP Vegas, and obviously this was the biggest one, but I didn't understand just how big it would be. It was a massive convention hall. It had thousands of people in there. Just anything you wanted to do. It wasn't just about the GP itself. It was about like all these side events happening, um, all these on demands, drafts and commander and all this crazy stuff. And so it, was, it catered to everything. There was like the artist booths, there was the panels, there was uh, the side events of all the different kinds. There was just people playing at the round table, uh, round tables on, on the side side. Um, so I was just blown away at how huge the scope was and how, how it catered to everybody in the magic community. Yeah, uh, it, it was huge. I was I was surprised at that, too. So uh, you probably know I don't really do live events, especially since I've started doing the content stuff. So this was my first big live event, and it was something. Uh, mostly spent the entire weekend just meeting people, and it was super cool. I got to meet so many people from the stream, uh, tons of people that I have known from there, people from Twitter, other content people that I had never met before. So that was just a, it was a blast. It was definitely a long and tiring weekend of just walking around convention centers and monorailing back and forth, but it was super, super cool. And I'm super glad that I finally did it. And we finally did this big meetup live event thing because it was, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we met a lot of fans. We were talking about that. Do you have any uh, fan stories, any specific uh, stories or memories of the fan part of GP Vegas, Richard or Tomer? 
five or so fans that came <laughs> yeah, up. Or, uh, or, or five fans. <laughs> yeah, all five of them were really, really nice. Uh, we played Commander with a couple of them. Um, and that was just a, a great event. Like, everybody brought a deck that wasn't, like, super I'm going to crush you. It was, it was actually felt like these were decks that could have shown up on Commander Clash and just blended seamlessly with us. So that was that was really nice. We had really good games. Um, everybody was just really really nice, and and we just talked whatever, and it was there was like no awkward no awkward stories to say anything. It was just well, there were plenty of awkward stories. Tober, thank you for that. <laughs> Tober, how 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 was your signature game this weekend? Oh, how man. many how many play mats or cards did you sign? <laughs> All right, well, so signatures are apparently a big deal now. Uh, I've had this just a standard signature since I was like eight or so. And it's just like to sign checks. It's just like to, to, the, the odd times that I actually need to use a signature. It's fine. I actually got shit for it from my parents because it's just like my initials is a little bit stylized and it doesn't look like much. It's not, it's it not looks impressive. like a star. It looks like a star. It's T and an A and they're stylized and they're fine. They're serviceable. <laughs> you know, they sign, they sign checks just <laughs> fine but then so my parents gave me shit for it like oh you should probably get a normal signature and then i started signing for like the five people and richard starts giving me shit for my ugly signature so i get very self-conscious as (laughs) as as a normal signature person would and i start like doing test runs for uh slightly better new signatures and i tried a couple different uh redesigns and i think i've actually settled on uh, a new signature that is uh, quite good, I would say. I would say it would be a good solid 8.5 out of 10 uh, on the signature scale, of course. Really? Yeah. So, so in 10 years, if you pull out, say, a Grand Prix Vegas playmat <laughs> and you see this, like, star, <laughs> and you're like, who, who signed this? <laughs> I, you, you'll know it's Tober. Well, you also know that that was a limited edition print run of my signature. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is the signature changed from playmat to playmat, so two people can get Tober's signatures and compare them, and yeah. they'd be totally different. There was actually one person who made me sign Mystic Remoras, like a stack of them. So the first one I did the the the, the, the classic, the version 1.0, <laughs> and then I, I asked, like, can I try something a little bit different on it? And uh, I, I, I did like little little uh, workarounds, redesigns on the signature. Finally, on the last one, I got it to, I would say, version 2.0, which is the new one, the, 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 the new standard, very, very nice. And also, I, uh, without asking him, I decided to alter, draw his Mr. Grimora. And um, I tried to make a killer whale out of the Mr. Grimora because, you know, it's a fish and, Mr. and, and whales are mammals, but they're similar-ish. They both swim. Um, <laughs> and uh, I forgot how a killer whale looks like, so I drew not a killer whale, but it has a it has a fin and such. And uh, I'm sorry for the person who I ruined your Mr. Grimora. Uh, if you're really upset, I'll send you one. I have a stack. <laughs> I I don't think Richard can say much about signatures though, because you just literally <laughs> print MTG gold. Yeah, it's not Richard. a signature. It's not if, a signature. If, if I use my normal signature, it is worse than Tomer Star. You can't make <laughs> oh, up God. my name. So I decided to print MTG Goldfish Richard. But it's not even a signature. That's more of like a message you left on the thing. An advertisement. Yeah. (laughs) No, no, don't don't make this sound bad. (laughs) I had the best interest. In in caps print, he writes MTG Goldfish (laughs) Richard. And if he's feeling fancy, he throws in a smiley face. This is for you guys. But they're like, what is this scribble? The star, they're like, oh, the star is beside MTG Goldfish Richard. That must be <laughs> Tober. Probably better known as Tober. No, here's the thing. They'll be like, oh, Richard wrote a message for me. How nice. But I want his signature. <laughs> Where's his signature? I guess he just forgot it. <laughs> All right, next time I'll add a star in there, Tober. <laughs> It's a little, a little something. Oh, uh, yeah. It was it was crazy. I have so many fan meeting stories, but some of them that stick out. Like, meeting the stream people was definitely awesome. Uh, they're like, like Goat Fiesta, Tano, so many people that have 
been subs on the stream for a long time or donated to the stream. So it was really cool because uh, on Twitch, you don't even see people. At least on Twitter, you see like faces kind of and know what people look like. So meeting people that I feel like I kind of known for a long time, but didn't really know. So that was super cool. One of my favorite parts of the whole thing was meeting stream people like that. Mm -hmm. As far as like specific stories, there were some interesting requests. I was mm -hmm. asked to to uh, alter the back of a Panharmonicon oh. and, and draw on it, and that went really badly. And the person who I did it for, and I just can't draw at all, but the person I did it for was there specifically to get cool cards, so they were getting all these alters by like Therese yeah. Nielsen, <laughs> and throughout the weekend, like every day, he'd come back to me and be like, oh, I got another one, but oh, look, that's still my favorite one, and show me this horrible <laughs> scribble on the back of this Panharmonicon. So that was sweet. I got uh, stopped in the bathroom and asked for a signature. Oh. That was uh, that was interesting. No, you don't do that. Uh, I had to write an apology note for a wife uh, for my voice because she hates my voice from the stream. <laughs> so I had to, had to write and sign that. So that was pretty fun. And one of my favorite parts was we were eating dinner at the fish and chips restaurant, Gordon Ramsay's Fish and Chips, and someone recognized my goldfish shirt. And the person just happened to be here on business. They weren't. They didn't even know there was a GP in town, but they knew Goldfish and got to meet them. So it was. It was pretty uh, very tiring and long, but super fun. And to add to the fish and chip story, we didn't have a seat. Uh, we didn't have a table to sit down and eat. But luckily, there was a table of fans, and they moved out for us because well, for Seth. <laughs> <laughs> and we were there too, so we we reaped the benefits there. So uh, that celebrity salary was really getting uh, getting some good value, both in the convention and around it. Uh, but I think the best story is the people that don't know Seth's face. Yeah. During, yeah. during the beta draft, there was a really nice guy next to us, but he was you know he you know we're watching the draft and they, they didn't pull the power yet. They're just pulling random cards. And they're like, oh, you know, how much, how much is, uh, how much is an underground sea? How much is a time walk? And Seth's like, okay, it's like, you know, 10,000. He's like, oh, what website are you using? <laughs> Everyone's like chuckling. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, later on, someone broke the news to him that he was talking to Seth, better known as Seth and all of the entire time. And then he's like, oh my God, you're Seth. <laughs> I'm a huge fan. He came over, but that was quite funny. Yeah, that, that was a good one. So we met a lot of fans, but it's, we are fans of also some of the people in the community. Yeah. What are your favorite stories meeting some of the, the other celebrities so at GP? My favorite story is actually a Tomer story. So, oh, God. So we're, we're taking the monorail into oh, the no. GP. And oh, we're, no. we're, we're, there was us and one other person on the car and going from the same stop. And the whole time we were riding on the monorail, I was thinking, is that Ben Stark? I think that might be Ben Stark. And Tomer was apparently thinking the same thing, too, when we got out. And as we started to walk into the convention, he whispered, is that Ben Stark? I was like, I don't know. It might be. <laughs> so so we're walking in, and Tomer finally is like, all right, I'm going to do it. And he was like, Ben! And yelled. And it was Ben Stark. He looked back, saw me and Tomer walking there, and just booked it. Like, oh, there's these, cra <laughs> these crazy MTG goldfish people are stalking me. i got to get out of here. I'd like to add to that story, because it's a little bit worse than even <laughs> Seth's recount. Uh, when, when I noticed that it was Ben Stark, or that I thought it was Ben Stark. The way I analyze to see if, if it's really the person is I keep staring at that person. <laughs> so this poor, poor, poor Ben notices this one guy just staring at him at the monorail. And like, I keep looking back and he, he's like trying to not look at us. But every once in a while, he'll like sneak a glance to see if, if I'm staring at him. And in fact, I was like, I'm just like, Every single time, just awkwardly, we're kind of, like, both looking at each other at the same time. He's like, holy shit, holy shit. So he takes, like, the, not the same monorail car as us. But sure enough, we're going to the same place. And uh, he's, speed, he's speed walking um, ahead of us. And then, you know, like, I, I decided, you know, I need to find out if this has been sorry. So I yell, Ben! He turns around, he looks, and then he, like, immediately, like, moves forward, goes into his speed run, and we can't catch up to him, so... Sorry, Ben, I was rooting for you at the beta, but... Uh, it, yeah. it worked, because he opened a beta underground seat. Yeah, I was... A beta the, Mox Emerald. I was the good luck stalker for his <laughs> event. <laughs> uh, otherwise... I got to meet a ton of content in Wizards people that I'd never mm -hmm. met before, which was really cool. Got to meet, like, Professor, uh, unfortunately not Wedge. Wedge was here. was looking forward to meeting him, but he's having some health issues. So uh, thoughts with Wedge this week. But, mm -hmm. like, Mark Rosewater, uh, Chris, 
something that makes MTG Arena. I can never remember your last name. I'm well, sorry, I'm Chris, but you're super awesome. <laughs> uh, so, but got to meet a ton of people that I was hoping to meet. So that was pretty fun. Uh, I stayed out of the way of the pros, though. Other, I did meet Efro and Athena Frolic, and they were super cool. But I figured the pros were like playing tournaments and probably like in that mindset, and I didn't want to just like wander around and tomer <laughs> to- tomer to them the out of the convention center. <laughs> oh, and oh, and oh, and read. <laughs> <laughs> I shook Reed's hand. He was in a rush, though, to get to his table. Uh, <laughs> but I shook his hand. I was like, I'm a big fan of your drafts, and uh, I'm a big fan of LSV. What about you, Richard? Who was the coolest person you got to meet? The coolest person? Probably Seth. <laughs> Probably, Probably better than <laughs> Seth and all of I think it was just awesome hanging out with both Tomer and Seth the entire weekend. Aww. They're cooler in real life than on camera and that's actually true people it's say that <laughs> but both these guys are pretty much exactly like they are when we cast or play videos or anything and you know we, we got to play a live commander clash got to oh got to do that in person mm-hmm. uh, me and Tomer decided to do a domineering draft having no knowledge of the format Hey, I, I had knowledge of the format. I've watched LSV drafted at least three times. I've seen Reed Duke drafted once, and I saw Ben Stark drafted in like twice the, the regular speed because he talks a lot and he takes forever <laughs> to pick. But I love his insight. So I've seen, I, I feel like I'm a guru of, of Dominator draft, actually. <laughs> Just the actual playing a match is where I start to and fall apart. What was, what was your record in your Dominator draft? Uh, 1 1. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I won a single round. That was the highlight. And then I got crushed by a very, very strong uh, blue-red wizard, I believe, with the Nabon that I opened and I passed to him, apparently. Uh, and the bond plus that bounce mage is kind of kind of brutal when you have multiple bounce mages. Yeah, yeah, that hurt. But it made me really want to start doing more drafts, especially Dominaria drafts. Well, that was fun. That was our only events. <laughs> Seth, yeah. you didn't do any events, right? You just did... You were just busy with the, the fan stuff. Yeah, I just spent the weekend pretty much just either sitting in one place for people to come find me or wandering around meeting people. So I didn't play any events. I did get to do, like, an Innistrad draft, which was super fun one night. Uh, so that was really cool. Played a cube draft, which was really fun. Some commander games. So I did get to play some Magic, but I did not actually want to sign up for any events because I just didn't want the commitment like the reason for coming out here was to meet as many people and committing to like 15 rounds of playing modern and sitting like in the tournament area didn't seem like it lined up with that goal so so if you haven't seen Seth play paper magic <laughs> is it a treat oh man <laughs> he plays like a total noob he can't <laughs> shuffle Forgets to draw. He forgets. Like, <laughs> said, he forgets to draw cards. He doesn't. He doesn't draw. untap his permanence. He he like draws first, and, like thinks, and then like you know. In the lands, a minute in front, into his turn, he untaps everything. Lands in front, and he also has like the planes. He has them in separate piles. No, you know, like you, you put like the planes and the same colored mana together. Some will have like one planes here, and then. Island and then island and then freaking whatever lands and then the planes on the other side and they'll forget about that planes. Maybe it's in the graveyard zone. Who knows? The upside down draws. He like manages oh, to man. draw a card upside down into his hand <laughs> yeah. somehow. Like amazing. <laughs> Moto does all that stuff for me. I don't. I don't have to think about things like that. But so. I, I will say we played Paper Commander and I haven't played Paper Commander mm-hmm. and boy, do your fingers get a workout shuffling oh, yeah. a hundred card. De- it was single sleeved. And it was, it was difficult. I I prefer Moto for Commander for this regards. Doing combat math. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> Missed stuff. triggers. Yep. Arranging the stack in paper. And then figuring out if you have all these lords on the battlefield that pumping up your your creatures. You have to be like, hold on, wait a minute. So I get plus one plus from this, and then I get plus one plus from this, and I get plus one plus oh from this. So that would mean that this creature is like eight four. All right, next creature. Let's do this again. <laughs> this is it gets messy. And actually, I I actually make my physical commander decks kind of differently than my MTGO ones because I have to take in I have to take in mind that shuffling is is a nightmare. So I make sure that I have as few tutors, as few fetch lands <laughs> as possible in my actual paper cards versus my MTGO ones, just because. I hate shuffling, especially like 
uh, uh, double sleeved ones. I have this like expensive five color enchantress deck that I don't want, you know, to get messed up. So that is the deck that has like the least amount of tutoring and shuffling possible. So speaking of expensive decks, Seth, I believe <laughs> you managed to hold some power mm, in yes. your physical hands. Can you tell us about that? Oh man, so I think it was the first day we were there, got the chance to play some old school over at the Vintage Magic booth. And if you're not familiar with old school, it's only cards from I think the first two years, like 1993 and 1994, yep. so like up to the dark or something that are legal in the format. So it's Kind of like Vintage, uh, you just have all the Power 9 cards, all the Mox, and all the Black Lotuses. So that was that was especially scary because it was the very first day. I think you mentioned my shuffling and playing. It improved slightly throughout the weekend the more I did it, but that was like day one. Yeah. And the very first paper deck I was shuffling in like five years is this like $50,000 yeah. Black Lotus deck. Were, were your hands like sweating and yeah, stuff like, please little... do not accidentally spontaneously <laughs> rip something. Yeah, I was a little shaky as I was like mashing yeah. these $50,000 cards together. And you shuffling and one of them like kind of just awkwardly yeah. bends and it's like a Lotus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a really fun game though. Though. It was yeah. maybe the sloppiest game of Magic anyone played. Uh, uh, <laughs> we were like, uh, my opponent drew off my deck a couple times, and I was like missing some phases and triggers. So it was. He had like extra workshops in his deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it beat me with eight uh, Mishra's Factory. Eight Mishra's so, yeah. Factory, new meta. But it was, it was super, super cool, and I was really glad I got a chance to do that. Uh, so. Yeah, that definitely is one of the highlights for me as far as playing Magic. Also, the Innistrad draft was really fun. We just had, like, a late-night draft with uh, a nice. bunch of people, thanks to Jay Zoller from the stream, who sent us out a box of Innistrad to draft, which was really cool. So we had a blast just doing Innistrad draft. Uh, what did you open, Richard? Snapcaster? Snapcaster. And then someone else opened a Liliana. So out of, like, 24 yeah. Innistrad packs, we got just, like, the two best cards and the entire set. And it, everyone had a great time, so it was a really fun experience, mm -hmm. too. So, uh, outside of the GP, we've been hanging out in Vegas. We're staying down kind of, like, on the Strip area and not out by the convention center, although it's only, like, three miles away. But So, we've been wandering around the city a little bit, eating in the city. So, what do you guys think of the non magic -y Vegas stuff? The food, the city itself, stuff like that. Any thoughts on that aspect of our Vegas trip? Uh... <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of Vegas. <laughs> what? You don't what? like Vegas? It's all right. It just feels like very showy. But like, I don't like I don't like gambling. So like, all these like casinos and the tacky rugs and all that stuff. I don't know. It's not. It's not. It doesn't appeal to me that much. But the thing that I really like is that there's so much variety in such a small area. Um, and there's all those shows. Like, we're going to be seeing a show tonight. I'm really excited for that. Uh, I like the, the weather. The weather was nice. I mean, it's oh, scalding nice. hot. It was, <laughs> it was it's scalding hot. Uh, what was it? How do you say? 100 degrees? It's 40 degrees for civilized worlds. <laughs> and uh, for Ameri America, it's like 105. <laughs> I think that's how it works. F? It was about 100, 105. Yeah, over, yeah. over 100, but yeah. thankfully, it's a nice a dry heat. So you're just melting, but you're not like sweating while you're melting well the worst part is it's like a hundred outside but like 60 <laughs> in the grand prix hall yeah but it varies like one day it's fine the other day it's like way too cold yeah. and you gotta go outside to warm up a bit you come yeah. inside and it's like a freezer again they can't find a sweet spot they gotta be like it's 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 like a <laughs> it's like a it's like really hot really hot outside and then you go inside and you're like in a freezer and you have to like jump in and out to try and find like a balance <laughs> Tor has already broken the, the swearing record on a single podcast and it's only been 23 I'm tired <laughs> we had a huge meal and I need coffee and I'm sorry but this speaking, is why I haven't been invited over, how how is the American diet it's you're uh, very excited. It's, uh, <laughs> First day here, you're like, we gotta try this, we gotta try this, we got these restaurants in mind. I was I was young and naive when I arrived in Vegas, and uh, I had In-N-Out, and I was so excited, because everybody was telling me how great In-N-Out burgers is. Wow! I go in, I get uh, I get the animal on my burger and on my fries, and then I'm like, yes! <laughs> traditional American meal, the best of the best is here! <laughs> and I eat it, and I'm like, this is... Mm, this is better than McDonald's. It's a little bit better than that. Uh, it's 
Not it's not as good as like AW or Five Guys. You guys have Five Guys. You guys have AW. Why why did the people tell me to try In and Out? Like this is not a special thing. I, I was actually quite surprised. So we we posted on Twitter and so many people were like, "Oh my God, In and Out! You got you got to go yeah, Shake yeah, Shack. Nice you got to go Whataburger, Burger. You got to yeah, Five Jack Guys. You the Jack and Bob. You're so good. People are very polarized, uh. but." If you're from out of California and you come to California, you yeah. try the in and out. It's the thing. Oh, Maybe God. it's not the best. But Maybe you, it's you, not the best. It's definitively not the best. I, I I still think it's the best fast food burger. Better than A and W? Well, we don't have A W here. <laughs> you don't have A and W here? No. No. What? I always assumed that it was ever. Okay. We do have Five Guys. So five have Guys is a different kind of five burger. Five Guys is though. good. It's, it's more expensive, but it's still better. Like you can't you can't have In and Out and then have Five Guys and be like, well, this is actually close. No, Five Guys is better. <laughs> what? Well, okay. You, YouTube better. comments. YouTube comments. We gotta know Five Guys or In and Out or McDonald's. Oh or God, like, who's McDonald's gonna not even McDonald's. on the list. Someone like. Might. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, you would have to pay me to eat a, a, a there, there, There's probably some area of the yeah. U.S. that is not because In and Out's only like West Coast. Mm. Five Guys is not everywhere. And then and then when you go to a good places, you have A and W. I didn't know. I didn't know the country doesn't have A and W. Poor souls. All right, all right, all right. What about what about breakfast? I think foods? I'm gonna rile up all the Americans on the podcast, which is like 99 percent of your audience. This is why I haven't been invited to the podcast. Well, <laughs> I'm just gonna shit on. Oh no. <laughs> So I'm gonna poof on. We'll edit it out. It's all good. I'm gonna poof on before Richard edited this. For the record, for the record, for the record Tober is 100% sober. 100% sober. This is like Hello. 2 p.m. He drank like five coffees. <laughs> I ate, ate, ate a huge snicker and yeah. I need another pudding. coffee. It's uh, we had a big meal. We we had had snicker infused yeah. bread pudding. It was good. And then a chicken, and it was just fried chicken, right? It was fried, fried chicken oh, portion for like had, five we people. We had chicken fried steak, which again, this is another, this is another sticking point here. Uh, Richard says that chicken fried steak is a staple of of breakfast. It's a breakfast staple, and you can get it anywhere, including Canada. And I disagree. I haven't heard a single place. Uh, in, in all my travels, Canada and Europe included, uh, that has chicken fried steak. I don't understand. I still, I, Richard is trying to explain where the chicken part of the thing, there's no chicken in the steak. But he's like, no, it's like how you fry it. It's like a chicken. But no, this is, it's fried. It's fried steak. It's, uh, it's our, it's all right. It's not a staple and I've never seen it before. But he's like, no, you can get it anywhere. Go to Toronto. Go to Toronto. Tomer, I understand. <laughs> Tomer is a silly Canadian, but Seth has not eaten. Richard is a Canadian too. Yeah. Oh, I love you. He's a turncoat. <laughs> so, I, I know what chicken fried steak is. I just don't consider it a breakfast food. It's not. It's, it does not it's seem breakfasty. Like steak for breakfast. What is steak for but breakfast? Snickers infused bread pudding. That's a dessert. Perfectly okay. It's a dessert. <laughs> it's labeled as dessert. It's not labeled breakfast food. It's labeled dessert food. <laughs> And so, then as Tomer's doubting me, the table behind us ordered chicken fried steak as well. And they were looked as disappointed <laughs> as you were. <laughs> no, it's actually pretty decent. It's just not something that I would get very often. It's not something that I've seen ever before. It was it was it was neat. I'll I'll say neat. It wasn't terrible. It was better than In N Out. <laughs> gosh, we're man. losing our in and out sponsorship <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> oh man uh so that's food do we have any other let's talk about before we move on and talk about some course at 2019 spoilers which we have to do because we are we are not the a and w slash chicken fried steak <laughs> podcast we do talk magic here on occasion uh so memorable moments <laughs> uh, what was your favorite moment from the entire vegas experience uh, gp related vegas related give me one or two of the things that absolutely stuck out as the best of the best from this trip uh okay well the boring answer is ben stark opened a beta mox emerald Mm -hmm. that was amazing that was amazing it happened at like i don't know 10 p.m or something so the (laughs) hall was a little empty but everyone's uproar people were chanting for lotus and we got to see power they were wearing their fancy white gloves which they (laughs) subsequently took off because they couldn't pick up the cards with them (laughs) But just seeing all those old cards, remembering how bad they were, seeing people rare draft, you know, the pros are always up in arms and like, 
integrity of the game. You can't rare draft. You gotta get you gotta you gotta get the proper pick. And here they are <laughs> picking like basic lands. Yep. <laughs> Third pick for the money. Uh, you know. So that that was entertaining. The matches themselves were very fun. Watching uh, two pros trying to figure out what happens when a band of creatures attacks into a band of blockers. Yeah. <laughs> some of which have flying, some of which do not. <laughs> they just bring their phone. Remember uh, who was casting? He said, like, we, we, have, we have a judge who's also, like, on, like, on the headsets. And he, like, when, when Danny question comes up, he, like, removed his headsets <laughs> and he walked away from the yeah. table because he couldn't help. <laughs> yeah, I mean, banding is simple is it? without the edge cases. Then you're like, well, what happens if there's a flyer? What, what happens <laughs> if there's something? What if things? there's two sides that have banding? That's not, it's not a simple mic. I can understand why they were like, you know what? We're going to leave this off for uh, future sets. I, I like Gabby's explanation. If there's banding and they're blocking, you cannot attack profitably. Yeah. <laughs> and that seemed yeah. like what, that's what happened during the beta draft. Gabby was great at it. Who was it? Mar- Mar- M. Martin Sutliff? Brian David... Oh, Marshall Sutliff. <laughs> who are the casters? Brian David Marshall. She was great. Not Tom. The other one. Oh, Tom Martell. Tom Martell, not Tom. Paul Rietzel was there, but we weren't watching... When they were casting, because yeah. we didn't really want to watch Dominaria Limited. You know what was the worst <laughs> part about the beta draft? It was when they cut to the Dominaria draft. <laughs> it's like, they're playing with Grey Ogres, and they're fighting through a circle protection. This is amazing. How often do you get to see this? Oh, and let's go back to the Dominaria draft. Ooh, there's a journey mage, and it's going to be bouncing. <laughs> Just because journey mage so... beat you with the Dominaria draft. No, it's so... like, how many times do you get to see Dominaria draft on, t- on the TV? Like, freaking the entire season, you're going to be seeing it, and you're going to be playing it. How often do you get to play beta cards? Never. How often do you get to draft beta cards? I never. And then I, they have it on the TV and you're like cutting to Dominaria. Are you kidding me? Nobody cares. Sorry, I, Wizards. I heard there was only one other confirmed beta draft since, I mean, beta. Like, mm-hmm. since this actually came out. Like, 2008. Like, it's, it's just not a thing that happens. But there's a... That was really cool. The beta draft was super awesome. And there's a couple more coming up. I think at Gen Con and one at one of the Japanese GPs. Mm-hmm. So... If you happen to be in the area, definitely make time to yeah. check out the beta draft because that was one of the highlights of the weekend, I think. If you're in the area, go there because if you're trying to watch it on Twitch, maybe they're going to show some garbage <laughs> instead. Some common area drafts. I think for me, one of the things that was super cool is uh, a fan of Against the Odds came up and had a gift for me, and it was every single winning against the odds card from the entire history of the se- uh, series and two binders, along with a printout of all the episodes, mm-hmm. and it was just, it was so cool and so thoughtful, so that was a huge highlight of my weekend. It's I've done so many episodes now, 144. Or maybe somewhere in that neighborhood, because I, I guess I also learned that I have <laughs> misnumbered the series. And Did there's he say a it was chronological order? Too. Yeah, 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 we got an email saying, way. you guys doubled up on this number, you guys yeah, yeah. on this number. Is that what the stars were for? Like, he cataloged it, he <laughs> yeah. had, like, a list, too, and on the cards. Like, he, it was really thoughtful. Not only was it, like, a very impressive collection, but it was also very, like, thoughtfully done and everything that that stood out to me as well like that was really really nice and I'm, i think i have to uh pick up the mantle and keep it going now and keep ordering as i do <laughs> against odds decks because i think it's just such a cool project and I, what i was gonna say is i've done so many that there's some that i hardly remember now when you make like so many different decks that we can do it for years and years and years eventually like stuff from three years ago i had some people coming up to me and be like oh i love this deck you did i'm like uh yeah that sounds like something I do, but I don't <laughs> actually remember that specific deck, but thank you anyway. So that was super cool. Also, Commander Clash Live, that was our one of our yeah. biggest adventures. Somehow we managed to come to Las Vegas, and our biggest adventure was <laughs> trying to record Commander Clash Live on Swiffer bars mm-hmm. with no air conditioning. We had sunglasses because the lights were so bright. And, and they we were spent, directly on our faces. Yeah, we wait. Uh, move, over, <laughs> move over, game nights. <laughs> We spent, uh, we've got this locked down, and we don't, we don't need any competition now. Yeah. We're, uh, we, we spent got the Swiffer bars. Hours setting it up. It was, 
it was very interesting. Yeah. So that'll be coming out maybe next week or the week after. So oh my god, it was such a mess. Yeah. Like all of us playing playing Commander, like not being familiar with Paper Magic, like not playing a lot of Paper Magic, and then immediately doing Commander where you have like fifty permanents on the board at any given time, and you're trying to resolve like, okay, now I make fifty tokens, and they all enter and they have haste. <laughs> what are their abilities? And just like, all right, now I dump my entire. Genesis wave for a billion or something. I know. Oh, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Tomer yeah, creatively Please. manages mania, mana during this, <laughs> where uh, we roughly round and guesstimate. I, I think I played perfectly. <laughs> yeah. it, was, I think, it was a perfect game. I think it, th- it was one of my finest moments, I would say. Pro level. Masterclass. Ma- Masterclass. Yeah, Ben Stark would be proud. <laughs> so, any more Vegas thoughts before we move on and talk about some Corset 2019 spoilers? Final I, thoughts. I just thought it was surreal. Like, commu- the the Magic community is so wonderful. And so, just meeting everybody there was great. Just talking to random people was great. Uh, when we were walking, like, 1 o'clock in the morning from our Innistrad draft... We were just like talking about like our favorite draft formats, and there were two people walking like some some ways ahead of us. And Seth was mentioning like how how he loves like Rise of the Eldrazi, and the two people walking in front of us then like joined in on conversation. Are you talking about magic? Are you talking about draft formats? Oh, Zendikar was one of my favorite. I'm like, no, you're wrong. It was bad. And yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the best was when we were drafting Triple Innistrad, oh, and these random people came up and like, hey, what are you guys playing? And then oh, yeah. Tim was like, like, oh, it's a Magic the Gathering card game. He was like, no, 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 no. What are you actually... Yeah, is, that, yeah, is, that, yeah. is that Innistrad? Yeah. Spider spawning? <laughs> yeah. that, that was the best. That yeah. was really sick. It's also just crazy. Like, there's so many, like, celebrities at, at the con. And, like, at the supermarket, they're not going to be stopped or anything. But, like, then you see Mark Rosewater, and he comes in like a rock star. And there's just, like, people who are just, like, congregating to him. Like, he was just... This a poor guy wanted to get like a cupcake or something, and we like swarmed him. There was like us, and then there was like a lineup of people who wanted to get a to get a uh, just a shot with him. So like it, it's crazy. It's it's crazy and it's so fun. But everybody's like so respectful and everybody's so nice, and you get to meet so many people in the community and face to face, and it's just wonderful. Like it and. Also gives you a chance to corner Wizards people and yeah. tell them what they're doing wrong. So I got to like catch Chris from Magic Arena. I was like, uh, you really should make new perspectives work. Yeah. <laughs> got to talk to Mark Rosewater Thanks, about, the, about, that. <laughs> about the Buy a Box promo. Yeah. We had a little conversation about that. So And you got to be cornered by people too. And, who yep, I got content. to get cornered and uh, told about my puns and mispronunciations. So mm. it's it, it was just it was super, super cool to get to meet so many people. And it was uh, I'm really glad we did it and I don't know if I would survive. Do I don't know how people do it. I don't know how some of the content people literally go to GPs like every weekend or every other weekend. I don't know how you do that, but I'm definitely interested in at least hitting up Vegas again next year because uh, it was just it was a great experience. It was super super cool. And if you came up and said hello, like thank you. It was super cool to meet you. Like there were so many of you. It was just it was awesome. So thank you to all of you for coming and hanging out because it was it was a blast and it really made my weekend. Anyway, uh, Magic 2019 spoilers. Magic 2019. Let's, uh... Magic 2019! I, I guess it's technically Core, tw- core Set 29. I don't know what to call this set anymore. I'm going to call M-19. it Magic 29. M19. That's what it says on the card. So, it is Magic 2019 spoiler season. Mm-hmm. We had a few trickle out last week, but now we're at the official start of spoiler season, and we got a bunch of Mythics today, some really sweet reprints. So, Richard, why don't you uh, lead us through some M19 spoilers? All right, so I didn't know this, but Magic 2019 is some kind of origin story. <laughs> mm. Maybe they could have called it Magic Origins. <laughs> but we're going back in the past. Magic Origins 2. <laughs> we got a Johnny Wise Counselor, Mono White and John. Does he have both eyes? I can't tell. Is this before he lost his eye? It might it be might before be. he lost his eyes. He's not wearing Elspeth's cloak either, so this is definitely a past to Johnny. Or someone who just decided, you know what, that cloak's getting kind of dirty. I'm going to put it in the wash, and I'm just going to pose... <laughs> Outside of that. Anyway, continue. If you can't hear, CVM is joining us. If you can hear the construction in the background. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what they're doing. It's like the cleaning the most outside prof- of a hotel room, and they're just banging brooms on their doors. The most professional podcast. <laughs> so, a Johnny Wise Counselor, three white-white, five starting loyalty, plus two, you gain one life for each creature you control, minus three, creatures you control get plus two, plus two until end of turn, 
minus 9, put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on target creature control where X is your life total. This card feels pretty bad to me. Is this a, is this a Planeswalker? Did I just read the Planeswalker, Johnny? Is it's this a Planeswalker? Hold on, oh, oh, that's not the right of Johnny. Is, was that the dual deck? Yeah, that was the... Wasn't that like the oh, dual yeah. deck? Wait, one? wait, wait. The wait, scary yeah. one he with the fangs. Wait, wait. Boring. That's the real one. A Johnny Adversary of Tyrant. Wait, where's yeah. where did he go? It well, is. that that oh, is a oh, my bad. Redo. That is a card. Redo, I mean, redo, redo. Card. redo. All right, take two. All right, this is the one card. coming in M nineteen. A Johnny adversary of tyrants. Two white white. Four starting loyalty. Plus one. Put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures. Minus two. Return target creature with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Minus seven, you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step, create three one one white cat creature tokens with lifelink. This one's not bad. No. I, I don't think it's an insane planeswalker, but it's Sorry. it's pretty powerful. I mean, I assume that you're playing this as like the top end of a white aggro deck. Like we we have some white aggro decks that have done all right in standard, but if you can play in a deck that's looking to play a bunch of creatures, uh, maybe like the white knight and the black knight that we got, put counters on those, keep attacking. You can get them back from the graveyard if they happen to die for some defense. And then the ultimate, not super scary as far as like gonna win the game right away, but three tokens a turn with lifelink, will win the game eventually if the game goes on for a few turns like that's a lot of free value every turn so i think it's all right mm-hmm. eh. mediocre eh, uh, at first i was like okay this is not bad you can pump your dorks you can return i don't know what a good two drop is right mm-hmm. now um but I, I like the old johnny where you you kind of curve into a johnny you mean and the johnny just you just uh talked about no, 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 no. <laughs> the one where he gives flying and, uh, uh, and it's like oh, the three a Johnny caller of brides, yeah, the three mana Johnny, like the the one where you run in and yeah. you're like, I'm gonna actually finish you off. This one is trying to grind you out. This one, yeah, this one's a grind. I don't know if that's enough power to grind <clears throat> someone out, especially you know if you say a Johnny or a Gideon. Mm. I would. I think Gideon is just much safer bet. You can always make a two-two knight in, instead of this, right? Mm-hmm. So, and this this ultimate is a bit slow. It's actually possible that you ultimate, you don't win. It's not like say, you know, Liliana: The Last Hope, where it grows exponentially. Eventually, you just get overwhelmed. This, if there's a, I don't know, a Goblin Chain Roller <laughs> <laughs> that comes down and nukes your army, uh, it is pretty sad times. So I think it's okay. Depends if we get enough white weenie, but this is not this is not the card that makes me want to build white weenie. Yeah. But if white weenie existed, maybe you'd put some in. I totally agree with that assessment. This isn't this isn't the uh, planeswalker that you're like, oh my goodness, uh, <laughs> uh, I need to what what deck can can I run this in and find a home and like can I build a shell around this? This is more like play test it. Maybe he will fit in a good as a four drop in some sort of deck. Maybe there's a deck that really, really wants plus one, plus one counters. Maybe there's a lot of two drops that are really powerful or one drops that are really powerful that can get back. He does kind of protect himself in a way uh, with the negative two is situationally. Uh, <laughs> it's it's like he wants to grind out. But... Would you play this in Commander? Well, in Commander, no, he's garbage, but... Uh... <laughs> But like, what about cats? Would you play it for flavor? No, it, it makes cat tokens. But, well, yeah, I guess if you're a cat person, then yes, you run it. But like, okay. it doesn't, you're not trying to win. You're so just commander being a cat playable. person. Commander so, staple. That's what you're saying. <laughs> commander staple in the cat deck. I'll show you. I'll show you. A Johnny's not happy. <laughs> Zero four for uh, the commander tournaments. All right, everyone's favorite mechanic: flip Thank cards. So you have to oh. check the opacity. <laughs> Of your sleeves. Oh, God. Nicol Bolas the Ravager, who flips into Nicol Bolas the Arisen. Uh. One blue, black, red, 4-4, four, four, legendary creature, Elder Dragon, flying. Uh, when he enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. Four blue, black, red, so seven converted mana in Grixis colors. Exile Nicol Bolas, return to the battlefield, flipped, activate this anytime you may ca- uh, cast a sorcery. Flip side, starts with 7 loyalty, plus 2, draw 2 cards, minus 3, deals 10 damage to a creature or planeswalker, minus 4, puts target creature or planeswalker from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control, minus 12, exile all but the bottom card of target player's library. 
That's a lot of text. For that, is, that is a maybe the most text on any magic card. Yeah, that's a lot of text for a mediocre card. I, <laughs> I don't think it's that bad. I know you guys don't really don't like it. It's, it's a four mana four four flying. That's already pretty good stats. It does something right away, making your opponent discard a card. So you do get at least some value right away. The problem is gonna be flipping it's gonna be incredibly risky. I feel like for this card to be good, it's got to be good enough just on its front half. Like, there probably will be some situations where you actually flip it. And if you do flip it, Nicole Bolas Artisan is really good. It is a extremely powerful Planeswalker card. But the problem is going to be you pay 7, your opponent fatal pushes, cast outs, <laughs> Veraska's condemned, and you literally will probably lose the game by skipping your turn and getting yeah. that 7 mana. So... So I don't know. I feel like it's not going to be a Planeswalker very often, but I don't think a 4-4 four, four flyer for 4 is that bad on its own. I mean, if it was colorless, but it's Grixis, <laughs> so you need 4 colors. Uh, it's legendary if you have multiple <laughs> of you, you kind of... Uh, I, I just don't... It's like, what do you play this... Like, it's not going to stabilize your board. It's not Yeah, like, enough. as a control player, it doesn't stabilize your board. Yeah. And, like, control is probably the only archetype that can flip this. It's not in green, so it's going to be pretty hard to ramp into. As a top-end finisher in an aggro deck, it is incredibly weak. I'd rather play a Hazoret. I'd rather play a Glorybringer. I guess it looks pretty silly compared to Rekindling Phoenix. Come yeah, to think Rekindling of Phoenix is like, okay, I trade, get an egg, uh, <laughs> you lose. I mean, it does make you discard a card. So you're, it's, it's kind of just a two-for-one by entering the battlefield, but we've had Thunderbreak Regent, which barely saw play, and there were a lot of Dragon Synergies in that deck. Mm -hmm. Is there any mechanic standard that can just cheat the flip? Probably not, right? There is not any way in standard to flip it, no, so, without paying the mana. So you got to go for that sorcery speed, pay seven, time walk yourself when somebody has an instant speed removal. So, Tomer, since we have you here, uh, how, what do you think about this card as a commander? Like, is this going to be popular because you kind of can have a planeswalker as your commander, or no? I mean, I'm sure people will like him because he's bull ass. I don't think it's a good card. I will, I will point... To the uh, current price tag that I'm looking at, there are more playable, more playable planeswalkers sitting around twenty dollars pre-order. Nickel Bolas thirty dollars. So there clearly is a demand for a Nickel Bolas card, no matter how garbage. Um, just because he's Nickel Bolas, he's a dragon. Woo, he's another dragon. All right, Nickel Bolas power rankings. Oh, oh man, original, original top. Original is. That would be if it was, like, the coolest Nicole Bolas That's, like, rankings. a flavor ranking. But <laughs> I think original Planeswalker Bolas... Yeah. Then... Yeah, original Planeswalker. Original Planeswalker yeah. would be number one. Yeah, I thought you were talking about... I know. Talking about, talking about, about I didn't say legend Nicole Bolas. You said original. Nicole Bolas Planeswalker, I meant. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 Nicole yeah. Bolas Planeswalker would be one. Yeah. Then the Hour of Devastation one would be two. Yeah. Then Legends, Nicole Bolas. <laughs> yeah. what, what, about the, what about the intro deck? Oh, there, there was. A, I don't remember. I don't. We know don't know what, what the he text does. Is on that. But it's probably ahead of the <laughs> Cobol It's probably about as good as the an intro deck Johnny that you you, you spoke about. <laughs> well. One thing I do like about Nicole Bolas, and this kind of segues us into some of our other cards, is we have a whole cycle of Elder Dragons returning, and I really like that they all kind of call back to some extent to their original version. So let's talk about some of the other Elder Dragons, Richard. All right. Vevictus Asmadi the Dyer. Do you know about the original storyline? All right, let, let's get the story you recap. Get some, you want to get some Vorthos let's get down? get some Vorthos in here. I'm going to get, like, critiqued so hard. Uh... <laughs> So, back in the day, in the 90s, back when we were all <laughs> youngins, uh, there was an Elder Dragon War, one of, like, the first things chronicled history-wise in Magic the Gathering, and, like, Seth is like, oh, God, no. I'm just, I'm just gonna take a nap. When oh, God, get no. me on the shoulder back the in the we'll day, talk about back when Magic was young, <laughs> we had Elder Dragons. They had a war. They were all, like, siblings and, or whatnot. It was sketchy. Um, they all fought... 
Uh, sometime during the end of it, Nicol Bolas got his Planeswalker spark, and that's when Planeswalkers were like gods. Um, he won. <laughs> Suffice to say, he won. He, he, he turned into Planeswalker, Elder, Elder Dragon. He won the Elder Dragon War, and basically a lot of the dragons died. Some of them managed to survive a little bit afterwards, but then they get killed unceremoniously afterwards or just get lost in time. And then the biggest losers of the dragons turned into uh, these worms. They're like the originators of the worms. They lose their limbs and their, and their wings, and they become like the progenitors of worms and stuff like that. So that, 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 that's, that's it. I'm done. That's all. That was a recap. Wait, how do, how do the new Elder Dragons fit into this? Like, Ojitai, yeah. Jamoka? Uh, they are just a new breed of Elder Dragon, apparently. They're just dragons that got really old on Tarkir, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they emerged from Dragon Tempests made by Ugin. He's the originator of the Dragon Tempest. These were the strongest ones that emerged from the Tempest, and they lived for, I guess, like, hundreds of years, and they eventually got Elder status. I don't know. The magic storyline's weird. <laughs> All right, all right. Back to Van Victus. Yeah, here we go. Legendary creature, Elder Dragon. Uh-huh. 6-6. Six, six, yep. Flying. Mm. When he attacks, or she? He? Whatever. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid saying Van Victus because I don't really know how to they, say it. They <laughs> when, be neutral. I'll just say Asmati. When Asmati the Dyer attacks for Azzy. each player, Azzy, <laughs> choose target permanent that player controls. Those players sacrifice those permanents. Each player who sacrifices a permanent this way reveals the top card of their library and puts it on the battlefield if it's a permanent card. So, hexproof. Haha. Indestructible. Mm-hmm. Haha. Hey. It is pretty sweet that it, it gets around some things that are normally hard to deal with. It's going to be interesting because it seems like a lot of these Elder Dragons are going to be 6-6 six, six for 6s. So, and they are all three colors, so it's going to come down to a battle as for which is actually better among them. I don't know. It seems like a powerful commander card. Its ability scales well to multiplayer. As far as standard, maybe if there's specific, like, hexproof threats that you really need to deal with or something, but I'm not sure otherwise that it's going to end up at the top of the Elder Dragon rankings as far as seeing standard play. I would hope there's better removal options. If you have to deal with like a problem permanent than like dropping a six mana creature that needs to attack to remove it. Wait, yeah. you have to kill your own permanent? No. Oh yeah, for each player. Yeah. You have to kill it. But, your... but then you can sack like a useless land and maybe get like an Emerical or something. Yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. So you can choose your land, mm-hmm. scry something scary on top, even and a, then even a put treasure it in the play. token. Take That's... a treasure token, turn it into a, an Emerical. Yeah. And for reference. The original mm. Via Victus Asmati. Two black, black, red, red, green, green. Not kind of the color cast. You needed dual lands to do this. Flying 7-7. Seven, seven. During your upkeep, pay black, red, green, or berry. Via Victus Asmati. And then fire breathing in all the colors. So one black <laughs> to get plus one plus zero. Or one red to get plus one plus zero. One green to get plus one plus zero. There's not actually yeah. much of a callback here, is there? Got a little weaker. I mean... So I guess this was colors. the younger days. It was a six six, and he grew into a seven seven. Yeah, and lost all abilities and just was <laughs> able to fire breeze. Worthy trade off. All right, uh, we got another elder dragon, Palladia Moors. Oh, I was gonna say for commander. Oh, okay. Fine. All right, yeah. we're, it's, it's a commander card. I didn't. I it's know we're like still talking. Card. All right, what are we doing? And in uh, it's just a very good value engine. Uh, obviously, in Jund, you have access to protection from your creatures. Uh, like asceticism, even like a lightning greaves, uh, swift of boots is amazing. Red has a lot of haste enablers. Uh, you just want to, you're basically taking out the best permanent your opponents have every single combat step, and you're removing the worst one you have, and everybody has to flip, but it's always a worthwhile effort. Yeah, it could bite you in, in, it, they could, it could bite you in the, in the rear, <laughs> um, uh, when you're blowing up something of your opponents and they get like, their best creature off the top or something like a dark steel colossus or whatever but it's always worth doing it because they can always whiff too and you're always removing the best thing they had at the at the time and you're removing the best the worst thing you had and you might turn it into like a dark steel colossus or whatever so very good card in commander i could see it being played quite a bit Sorry. all right continue palladia moors <laughs> the ruiner three red green white so six in naya six six flying vigilance trample Palladium Moors the Ruiner has hexproof if it hasn't dealt damage yet. 
So you can play it on defense, and it's just a really good blocker, I but guess. Until it blocks, and then you can kill it. But then and you then, can blink it. And then you can... <laughs> this is what... This is what like, no, Ojitai, you know, when you're ready and good to go, you mm-hmm. tap and you attack. When he's untapped, you get hexproof. But this is like when you block, it suddenly loses hexproof. So, like, what is it doing? Yeah. If you want to protect it, you can just literally do nothing. How good is... I mean, it gets that, it gets that first hit. It's going to do something before it dies to removal. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It has it has some sort of like pseudo protection. It's kind of weird. <laughs> it's a little weird. Yeah. I don't know if it's that good. I mean, it's okay. It's got a lot of mechanics. It can trample over like glory bringers and stuff, but it's just kind of a big flyer, and yeah. we have a lot of those in our standard format. So yeah. Commander wise, I also don't think it's very good. <laughs> Um, it, it, it doesn't have a lot of mechanics that make me think, oh, it's going to go into such and such an archetype. The only thing that it seems decent at is Voltron. Voltron strategies, you make it your commander, and then you try to win with commander damage. You suit it up with equipment and auras and all that stuff. But in Naya, we have already a far superior option for Voltron. That's Oral the Mistwalker. It gets plus two plus zero, uh, for every single aura attached to it. So it gets big very, very quickly. And the most important thing is it permanently has hexproof. So you never have to worry about, oh, I attack once and then you can kill my aura. Aura is actually very, very difficult to deal with. So that's why he's so good. So you, this Naya Commander, Naya Voltron versus Naya Voltron, and Palladia is just a worse version, I think. Yeah, and so the original Palladia Moors is Naya and just Flying Trample. Flying Trample, and this one has Flying and Trample. Yeah, so so Palladia Moors was like, this this fake hexproof is so bad, I'm just going to throw it away. <laughs> so yeah. I don't need it and lose Vigilance. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. All right, next card, we have uh, another dragon, which I think Tomer is very excited about. Mm. We have Lathless, Dragon Queen, 4 Red Red, 6-6, six, six, Legendary Creature Dragon Flying. When another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control, create a 5-5 five, five Red Dragon Creature token with flying. One in a red, dragons you control get plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. It's insane. Seems like a great casual card. Is it's another... better than the Elder Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you gotta really build it around it. I can't imagine that in standard, because all like so many of the dragons are six drops, your curve would be so bad to really make this work. But if you're building like a dragon commander deck, it seems like an auto include pretty much, and maybe like Brawl. We got Brawl, we got lots of dragons in Brawl where I think you can see the continuation of Wizards like pushing towards that format, wanting to make sure there's all these unique commanders for Brawl and also normal commanders. So, I don't know. It's cool that it's when it uh, enters the battlefield whether than rather than cast, because you can potentially do some, like, blink shenanigans to make dragons, or, like, mass blink, like, eerie interlude, and pick up all your dragons and come back down and just make a ton of dragons, and there's Dragon Tempest, I think, that deals damage equal to dragons entering the battlefield and gives them... Gives the dragons haste. So I think there's some, like, cool, casual things to do with Lapis. But again, it's just another big dragon in standard. And I I, I don't know. I don't know how to rank these anymore. We have, like, so many 6-6 six, six, or 6 <laughs> flyers. And uh, some of them might be standard playable, but I have no idea which it's going to be. It's all dragons from here. Uh, I think in Commander, yeah, you're, you, you hit it right. It's it's dragon tribal staple. Any, any dragon tribal deck. Uh, it's not like a combo deck like Sign of the Earth Dragon. Uh, all the other ones are going to love Lathless. It's a very effective, uh, just a beatdown card. It's going to finish games very quickly. It's kind of similar to Udvar Hellkite, where whenever a dragon you control uh, attacks, you put in like a 6-6 six, six dragon token. This is kind of similar, a little bit worse, but it also has that anthem effect. And it is legendary, so there's more synergies there. You can use it as a commander and all that stuff. Um, so very, very powerful inclusion. All right, next up, we're done with dragons. Mm. It's it's Kalia Day. We're going to angels. Mm. Resplendent angel, one white white. It's a mythic. Three three flying. At the beginning of each end step, if you gain five or more life, create a four four white angel token with flying and vigilance. Three white white white. So six in total until end of turn. Resplendent angel gets plus two plus two and gains life link. I think this card's really good. I think it has potential to be very strong. I think it might even have potential to see play in older formats, uh, in like Death and Taxes and Legacy or something, maybe in Ether Vile decks in Modern, but 
Uh, a 3-3 three, three flyer for 3 is already a decent card on curve. And then, obviously, if you're building a life gain deck, you can get some sweet value almost like... Uh, you can with the horse. Uh, Suncrest Mare. Suncrest Mare, yeah. That similarly, where if you can play this on the turn that you already gained a bunch of life, you can immediately start making angels on the end step or even on your opponent's end step if you can keep gaining life. And if you get to the late game, this actually kind of works with itself. You pay six mana if you got nothing else going on, attack with this with lifelink, get enough life to make an angel, and kind of spiral out of control that way. So I think all around, the card is good on its front hand just as a 3-3 three, three fire for 3, and if you build around it a little bit, uh, it's, it has potential to be very powerful. I think this might be one of the chase rares or mythics from the set as far as tournament play is concerned. Yeah, and even if, if the game's going very late and you just top deck a Resplendent Angel, you're attacking with it and you have 6 extra mana, you can attack basically with a 5-5 five, five lifelink and then immediately make a token out of it. So it, also, it doesn't work by itself. Yeah, also worth mentioning, uh, we have Lyra in standard. And mm -hmm. we always think of Lyra as a Bane Slayer angel, but it actually has the pumping other yeah, angels lifelink. and giving them lifelink tax. So with this, like one of the problems with building real angel tribals, we just didn't have early drop angels. So this is going to be really sweet. I'll be interested to see if a sort of like pseudo angel tribal deck can develop or you're curving like Resplendent Angel into Shalai, into Lyra, and just really going to town with, uh, with the angels. Because we have a lot of powerful and even a pretty good curve of angels in standard now. Yeah, I was going to say, on its own, I'm lukewarm. It's like probably a good card, but not too crazy. But with Lyra in the format, <laughs> who conveniently has five power and lifelink <laughs> and first strike, I guess you, you can get the angel during first strike combat if that's somehow relevant. No, it's at end step. Oh, it's end, end step, yeah. But five, five, first strike in Lyra, which is already seen play. So you drop that against Mono Red, they're probably pretty dead. You hit them with it, they're probably pretty dead. But you throw this down afterwards, they're super dead. So Watsy's not messing around. <laughs> they don't want Mono Red out of control. I think Life Gain and Angels go together so well. We have, uh, what's, what's the enchantment EDH? The Angelic Accord? Yeah, is it the one where whenever you gain life, you make an angel? I think it's as long as you gain four life yeah. in yep. turn, you make That's an angel. That's an enchantment. Yep, so that goes with this. Mm-hmm. So I like it, and yeah. I, I like the ability to pump. If you somehow have twelve mana, you can make you can make it a seven seven. Yeah, I, I you know oh yeah twelve mana. Yeah. <laughs> True. Uh, I think in commander, it's going to be an auto clue in any angel travel deck. That's like it's an incredibly popular uh, archetype. Everybody really wants to build angel travel, and the price of the casual cards are definitely a reflection of that. But we don't have a lot of angel travel support yet, and I feel like they're uh, Wizards of the Coast now kind of moving towards. Uh, supporting that first with Lyra and now with Resplendent Angel. Uh, so they're going to be really good in Angel Tribal decks like Kalia of the Vast. You can just make an Angel deck out of that. If you really want to be hardcore, you, like, you can go Mono White Angels with, with Lyra leading in charge, but I don't think that's very good at all. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend that, but, um, any angel shell, this is going to be very powerful. Um, also, decks that are, are life gain that can uh, significantly can get that trigger many times. Basically, any deck that can also run angelic cord will really like this. Uh, making gain five life each each end step is difficult to set up, but once but there's a lot of decks that can actually do that with a couple cards on the battlefield. Uh, Tristani, for example. Uh, gains life equal to the creature's toughness whenever it enters the battlefield, and it can tap to populate. So there's a lot of synergies between the angel that makes 5-5 five, five, uh, angel tokens and Tristani, which gains life whenever a creature enters the battlefield. Uh, so basically, you can get at least two turns very easily with Tristani. Like, a, the angel enters the battlefield, uh, you gain 5 life, you make another angel the next turn, then Tristani populates that angel in the turn afterwards, um, it enters the battlefield, you gain five life again, so it's, it's, it's pretty dirty. Actually, Trasani and Respondent Angel, you just get a 5-5 five, five angel every single turn without doing anything, right? Oh, no, it's a 4-4 four, four angel, a so four, you're gonna um, need a, you a need, pump effect. You need some sort of pump effect, some sort of anthem on the battlefield, and you basically make a 5-5 five, five angel every single end step in a Trasani deck, so that's pretty insane. Um, and, and it's then, each end step as well. So. Yeah, each end step, so you get a 5-5 five, five each end step. Also, there's the Orzov Battle Bond Partners, I forget the name, but there's like an angel and a demon, and the angel makes two twos whenever you gain life at the end of each turn, and the demon can eat uh, a creature and you gain life equal to its toughness or something like that. So there is like some looping effects 
over here in those type of decks as well. So it's very good in life gain decks, very good in angel decks, very good in life gain token sacrifice decks. All right. Last spoilers, we have our Reefence. Uh-huh. Crucible of Worlds at Mythic and Scape Ship Shift. Yeah. <laughs> Mythic. <laughs> uh, Crucible and Scape Shift are really interesting. I don't know if either one is going to be playable at all in Standard, but they are. They show off the awesome part of the core set. And one of the things that we were missing without having core sets, and that is. It's a place that Wizards can throw in these random $50, $60 cards that we need for Modern that, yeah, sure, maybe they aren't on flavor for Kaladash or whatever, Amonkhet, whatever block we're doing, but the core set gives us a place where we can just have these cards, so even though they're probably not going to be great in Standard, and who knows, maybe Landfall comes back or something and Scapeshift is relevant, or there's there's some combo that we can do uh, with Scapeshift, or maybe we get Fetchlands and makes Crucible worlds into a thing but most likely they're not going to be great in standard but it's super cool to see wizards really taking advantage of the opportunity that the core set gives to print these expensive cards that we need for modern that we need for commander that they can't really do in non-core sets yeah commander scape shift and crucible worlds are really really good reprints scape shift any basic any land deck titania uh protector of argoth Gitrog Monster are both going to love it. Any Landfall deck, like Tatyova, is going to love it. Uh, Five-color Mazes End decks, where you just have, like, ten random lands, and you just sacrifice them, put all your lands, all your gates into the battlefield, plus Mazes End, you automatically win. Crucible Worlds shows up in the same decks, but even more, because basically any deck that runs a bunch of fetch lands and strip mine are going to really like the effect. So these are amazing reprints for Commander as well. And they're like, I think Crucible's 60 ish dollars and Scape Shift's just over $50. So yeah, it's going to make else. opening boxes uh, a little more appealing as well to have these high value cards in the Mythic slot. Mm-hmm. And I think, does that bring us to the end of our M19 spoilers? Do we have any, any other M19 thoughts on the way out the door today? Or is it time to move on to a Las Vegas edition of Fishmail? I don't know what the Las Vegas edition of Fish Mail is, but yes, we will move on to Fish Mail. <laughs> We're going to answer a lot of gambling questions. <laughs> if you have any questions, send them to at MG Goldfish with the hashtag MG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. From Sebastian Tans, do you think modern needs Wasteland? Uh, that, that's a really hard question. I really like Wasteland, but I'm not sure if it would make the format better or if we would just end up with these like resource denial decks uh, similar to what we see in Legacy that would actually make the format less fun. Uh, I like the answers Tron lands. That would be the primary thing. But against Tron lands, Ghost Quarter, Field of Ruins are not bad. So I used to really think I wanted Wasteland in Modern. But the more I've thought about it, the more I'm kind of like on the fence. I think it would be fun and I would enjoy playing it, but I'm not sure it would actually be a healthy thing for the format. Yeah, I don't know that we need it or if it would even do anything, but I do like the idea of forcing people to play basics. I hate how perfect mana is um, in Modern, where you can play a turn one dual land and do whatever you want, or you can play fetch into shock, you can play fast land, and there's basically no consequences as long as uh, by turn three you have fetched a basic for Blood Moon or whatever. Now, uh, if you turn one dual land and someone just wastelands you and you're done, that that's a thing. And I kind of like that in Legacy. I know a lot of people hate that, but I like that. So I like that interaction. Now, whether that makes Modern better, I don't know, because that would essentially kill Tron. It would probably kill Eldrazi. Uh, you no know, Death Shadows, deck like that. They, I don't think they would exist if you have Wasteland. So maybe maybe this isn't good for the format. Yeah, but I, it would be fun. I'd definitely be concerned of like Delver or even yeah decks like that that can just like drop a threat on turn one and then just like Legacy, just like Wasteland your land, attack with Delver, Wasteland your land, attack with Delver. Like I don't know if that's a, really a fun play pattern for Modern, but yeah. it, it's like Blood Mooning someone, but they just have no lands and they can never get out of it. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's right. You're winning me over with the blood. So let's do it. All right. Uh, Nate Muzi, if Watsy released functional reprints of reserveless cards, uh, same function, just updated to the new Oracle text, new name, do you think the price of the originals would drop at all? Um, I think it somewhat depends on the card. The problem with that is... Uh, in some cases, at least, then both cards would be legal, and that might lead to some problems if you could play 
uh, eight black lotuses in your deck, for example, or something, because they would have different names. But I don't think in general, especially for the earlier reserve list cards, I think the earlier reserve list cards you could reprint with the exact same name and it wouldn't have any real impact on the prices. If you get to the later end with like Urza Saga era stuff, then you might see a bit of a price decrease, but I don't think it would be a, too huge of a deal now. Yeah, I think something like, say, Dual Lands, uh, Beta Duels, Alpha Duels, maybe even Unlimited, the old original Duels uh, would not change at all. Those are collector items. People, you know, take Lanamore Elves and Birds of Paradise from Beta. It's been reprinted like a billion times, but they hold a lot of value in those old sets because it's the original printing. Uh, but revised cards, like revised duels, I think, would take a big hit. Yeah. Uh, you know, depends. Like, maybe it's offset by the influx of legacy players, but I'm somehow going to doubt that. <laughs> but I think the original cards will maintain value. But kind of the later reprints, like revised and things like that, they'll, they'll, they'll take a hit. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. All right, next question. That one, Okazaki, how many decks do you each typically own and maintain? When new cards are released, do you focus on cards for your decks, or do you go for everything useful in case you want to build a new deck later? Seth, how many decks do you own? One, now, since Tomer gave me a commander deck while I was in Vegas. It's your only one? Yeah, I, uh, I don't... Literal one deck across all formats. <laughs> I don't... Did you touch like the deck and like, whoa, this feels weird. You saw me shuffling. Magic cards. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's not including Magic Online. I have right. I have a pretty big Magic Online collection, but in paper, I just don't really play paper. I got lots of random cards, but they are not in deck form. So, uh, as far as as far as the best way to go about it, I would probably focus on getting the cards that you need for decks rather than everything. I guess if you have a ton of disposable income and just want to collect everything, that's fine. But I I don't think there's a big reason to just buy everything just in case right away. I think it's, especially since prices tend to go down after a few months, I think you actually would cost yourself more money if you bought everything right after the set release rather than just getting the minimum that you need and then buying the rest a few months later when there's more supply on the market. Yeah. Tomer, how many decks do you own? I think I own seven commander decks. I don't own any standard decks currently, but I, that might ch- soon change. No modern, no nothing else. Um, and I purchase a couple singles each time a new set is released if they would go into one of my new decks or one of my, my current decks. Uh, so I don't really spend that much on, on paper magic either. Um, and yeah, I don't buy boxes or anything. Just like a single every once in a while. Yeah, so. I own one commander deck, which Tomer gave me, Najila. Thanks, Tomer. Yeah. I own Jund and Modern, and then all the pieces to swap into every other BGX variety. <laughs> so Abzan pieces, just black green pieces, black green colorless. And I have actually Legacy Merfolk and Modern Merfolk as well. And I typically don't buy cards until I want to play with them. So even if I think this is going to be the greatest thing in Jund or whatever, until I actually want to play with it, I don't buy it. And that lets, you know, it's good and bad. If the card turns out to be the greatest thing ever, then it's going to go up in price. Uh, let's say Coligan's Command or uh, Collective Brutality. But in most cases, the card will be terrible and it will go down in price. So by the time I actually want to play it, I'm playing against the odds and it's actually cheap. <laughs> Next question, we have Taskmaster1995. So people like to talk about no ban list modern, but what about no sideboard modern? Oh. Since decks like Affinity and Dredge fold to sideboard hate, would they be better in this format? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. I think it would be a, a very miserable format. I think oh. I think the Dredge and Affinity would be pretty overpowered, or people would have to start playing like Stony Silences or Graveyard Hate in the main deck, and then the decks are going to be weaker in less fun overall i think so i think sideboarding is if anything i think the conversation is more about if modern should have more sideboard slots rather than not having a sideboard i think that's what the pros complain about the most is that that modern more so than standard is it really feels like rock paper scissors for them where like their matchups really determine whether or not they can actually move to the final rounds uh so not having a sideboard at all would probably be very miserable and probably a lot of people who do go to these tournaments would stop going to those tournaments 
I, I kind of like this idea. I mean, there is no sideboard standard that's called Best of One Arena. <laughs> And I think it's actually pretty cool because you play versatile cards like Doomfall, like you wouldn't normally play such a card, but because it does a little bit of A and a little bit of B, <laughs> or people main deck, uh, what's the cycling disenchant? The Dissenter's Deliverance? Yeah. You play like certain weird cards, but you have an all-around deck, and you don't run into the field ads. Like, I understand that when you play Affinity or Dredge, you're supposed to win game one for free, and then your opponents are supposed to win the sideboard games for free if they draw their cards. That doesn't seem as fun. Maybe we should just try to make well-rounded decks that, you know, if you want a free win, you, by, you know, running main deck, rest in peace, you run the risk of it doing literal nothing against other decks. Maybe maybe that makes more well-rounded decks. I don't know. But the meta would change, I think. And yeah. Maybe everyone just plays, like, Affinity and Dredge, and I, it's a bad change, but it would definitely change. I think it has potential, but it would definitely be... Uh, Watsu would have to be definitely a little bit stricter on terms of, like, uh, the faster decks, like combo decks that it can win on turn three, for example, might be a little bit too fast even for a flexible removal or flexible answers. So some of those would have to be, you know, slowed down significantly so that the, the versatile answers that we have available to us, like cycling answers and stuff like that, will have a, a chance to shine. All right. Echo Base MTG are singles you can buy from Card Hoarder or MTGO Traders uh, coming from Moto Packs or Drafts. Or what about older cards, like cards played in Vintage or Legacy? Where do they come from? Uh, so the older cards are mostly already... Everything on Moto comes from packs or drafts. The older cards just came from packs or drafts several years ago and are floating around in the system. Also now, uh, the other kind of pack we have are the treasure chests. So that's how there's a trickle of supply. Uh, if you win tournaments or do well in tournaments, you get treasure chests. And in those chests, there's a mixture of newer cards and older cards. And Wizards changes up the list every set release to include like high value older cards that aren't getting into the system any other way to make sure there's still uh, some supply as hopefully the client grows and more people play the the prices won't get too out of control but that's a basic system some cards come like via promos they used to give up promos there's actual products in the moto store for example if you want planeswalker deck cards you have to buy a planeswalker deck so that's why uh, you never see those intro pack planeswalkers available in bots. That's that is true. All right, uh, it's Bruise Day. Is Coiling Oracle too good for standard? Merfolk Branchwalker is basically a powered down version, but less man intensive. I think it could work. I think Coiling Oracle could be okay for standard. Is that the two mana one one draw card? No, it's uh, like look at the top of your library. If it's a land, if it's a land, you put it into draw. battlefield. If it's not, you draw a card. Yeah, I think that Coiling Oracle is probably fine. We see things that are similar to it, like a uh, Elvish Visionary. Uh, you mentioned Branch Walker, so I think I think that it's close enough, especially when you consider it's in two colors and there's a cost to that. I think it would be it would be good, but it would be fine. Well, but it ramps. I mean, we got Land War Elves. It dies to chain. It dies to chain roller. It dies to chain roller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's fine. Dies to chain roller. SSJ Goomba. Do you think with the success of Black Red Aggro decks and Standard, Turbo Fog may be viable? So the problem is, I think that Turbo Fog could be built to have a really good matchup against the Black Red decks. You just got to make sure you can answer hasty set, uh, hasty threats and planeswalkers. The problem is uh, kind of the secondary decks, the decks that are actually being able to compete with the red aggro decks are almost creatureless control decks. And if you're playing Turbo Fog against the deck that's just looking to mill you out with Teferi and has a million counter spells, <laughs> it is a nightmare. You're like half of your deck is just dread, uh, dead cards. So that's the challenge. I think you can beat Mono Red consistently with Turbo Fog, but I don't know if you can beat the decks that beat Mono Red. So that's why the deck probably won't, isn't going to win a GP anytime soon. All right, next question. Costal Nassetti, do you guys know if there will be any more wipes on Arena? I stopped following the news and I'm super scared to play a lot just to lose everything and have to grind everything again. Yes, there is for sure one more wipe. They have said that it's possible that there's more than one more, but their plan is to have one more wipe as they go out of closed beta and into wide beta. So yeah. we don't have a date for that yet, but they're guaranteed to be one more for sure. There is definitely going to be a wipe when the game releases. So for sure that will happen. Most likely another wipe when we switch from closed to open beta. And then who knows how many more wipes in between. 
So uh, you will get wiped. So the good news is if you use gems to buy stuff, your gems get refunded uh, when they wipe. So in that sense, you get like double the use out of your gems. Yeah. Because you can draft. And then when they wipe, it resets. You get your gems back and you can draft some more. Next question. Random Fedora. So after playing Commander side events at Grand Prix Vegas, thanks Seth for signing my card. I feel like if any card were to be banned in Commander, it should be Paradox Engine. Thoughts? Did you play a Paradox Engine game? Uh, no. Well, sort of. I did borrow someone's Cast Storm deck for one game, but I don't think I actually have comboed off with Paradox Engine. Uh, does it need to be banned? I don't know. It does seem like if someone resolves it, they probably win the game. So maybe? What do you think, Tomer? You play more Commander than I do. It's five mana, isn't it? Six it mana? It is five mana. Nah. <laughs> Sorry, no. It's like the best, the best competitive Commander decks are not are not looking to dirtle of six mana spells. Uh, five. Like five <laughs> mana spells. Like, it's... Yeah, it's good in some decks, but they're not tier one decks. They're like tier two decks. Like, it's a Solala deck. Or something like going infinite with mana rocks. It's just it's just too slow. Like you're gonna lose to Doomsday, you're gonna lose to Yusan much faster than that. So it's not it's good. It's really good in casuals. It's like broken in casual settings. It's good in competitive settings, but it's not the best. So uh, there's a lot of other things that probably would need to be banned in a competitive format or change rules change in a competitive format before Paradox Engine gets the X. All right, that's all our fish mail for this week. Thank you to everyone who sent them in. If you have questions, send them to the hashtag MDGFishMail and we'll answer your questions. And I think that brings us to the end of episode 177 of the MDG Goldfish podcast. So any final thoughts, uh, crew, on the way out the door today? Uh, Vegas, M19, anything else? We can turn the air conditioning back on. We, we can finally turn the air conditioning It gets hot. Ah! Really fast. We turn off air conditioning to record content, and it's off for like 40 minutes, and then you can start feeling it. Yeah, yeah. that Vegas weather. And also just people room. Well, I guess uh, for the sake of getting the AC back on, <laughs> that is the crew signing out. So, Richard, Tomer, thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you to everyone for listening. We will be back next week to talk more Magic 2019 and whatever else happens. So, until then, this is the crew signing out, and we'll talk to you soon.